Today we're exploring generic pipelines in Unity, a pattern that lets you build clean, reusable decision chains for anything from AI interest to damage calculations. We'll start with a simple generic version that already eliminates copy-paste and centralizes logic. Then we're going to evolve it into a full fluent chain that adds perfect IntelliSense, methods that only appear at the right steps in the chain, and compile time guarantees so that you can't wire things in the wrong order. Same speed, dramatically safer, and more expressive code. We'll go from basic to advanced, one step at a time. Let's get into it. Let's take a look at a very simple generic processing chain. Here, we're looking at a tiny, reusable decision pipeline in Unity. Starting from any point in the world, we want to answer one simple question. Is this thing close enough to the player to matter? Instead of writing the same distance check over and over with if statements scattered across scripts, we build the entire logic once. When we're done, we can compile this into a high-performance delegate that potentially could be called thousands of times per frame. So here, we start a chain that takes any world position and measures its distance from the player. Then we convert that raw distance into a smooth 0 to 1 relevance score. And then we turn that score into a clean true or false using runtime threshold. And then we compile the whole thing into a single reusable function that you can pass around like data and potentially call thousands of times per frame. Now we'll start by building the simple version of this, but by the end of the video, we'll evolve it into a full fluent type safe pipeline that supports IntelliSense and domain specific methods. Let's jump into it. Let's start by defining an interface that will represent a single transformation step. It'll take in an input type of T in and return an output of type T out. And here the in and out variance markers are gonna let us safely chain processors together even when the exact types evolve along the pipeline. If you want to brush up on generic variants, we have a video about that on the channel already, which I'll link in the description. Now, every step in our chain, distance, calculation, scoring, filtering, and whatnot, will be a class that implements this interface and the single process method. So it'll take in the result of the previous step in the chain, do some processing, and then pass it as T out. Next, let's define a delegate that will mirror that same shape, giving us a lightweight way to compile an entire chain down to a single callable function we can store or pass around. Now, let's build our first concrete processor, one that takes a vector 3 as input and outputs a float distance. Here, we can keep a reference to the player transform so every distance calculation knows where the origin point is. In the constructor, we can inject whichever transform we want to measure from, then we store it so it's ready each time process will be called. The process method will transform a world space position into a scalar distance, giving us the first stage of our chain. Now let's add a second processor that will convert a raw distance into a normalized score. This scoring function will shrink higher distances towards zero, which works nicely when we want closer points to produce higher influence. Next, let's add a filter stage that will turn the score into a Boolean decision. Instead of storing a raw value, we can store a function so the threshold can be changed at runtime. Let's take that function in through the constructor and store it. Now we can query that every time the process runs. So here the score becomes a yes or no decision. And because we call the function each time, the filter always uses the latest threshold value. Now let's create a tiny combinator that stitches two processors together so the output of one becomes the input of the next. Let's hold a reference to both processors, one that goes from A to B and one that goes from B to C. In the constructor, we can take in both of these processors and store them for later. Now, this combinator also implements the iProcessor interface. So in our process method, we can perform the actual composition by running the first processor and piping its result into the second. Seems simple, doesn't it? Why don't we turn this into an expression body method? Now, there's only one more thing to do. We're going to build a small wrapper around our processor chain so that we can compose these steps fluently. So let's just call this class chain. We can have a field to hold the processor at the head of the chain, no matter how many stages we've added later. So in the constructor, we can take that in and set it. Then we can grant access to this class with a static factory method we'll call start. So anytime we want to start a chain, this will create a new chain with the first processor. Now let's add composition. The method then will let us attach another processor that transforms T out into a new type T next. Here we'll create a new combined processor forming a longer chain 
and return a new chain representing the updated output type. Now, beyond this, we need a couple more methods. Let's have a run method that would execute the chain immediately, which is great for a quick one-off evaluations, but we could also have a compile method that would turn the whole chain into a reusable delegate. This lets us store it, invoke it every frame, or pass it to other systems. Now that's all the code we need for this simple version. Let's go back to our example. So let's store our chain in a variable we'll just call simple chain. Now, even though the final result is Boolean, we're going to start with a chain of type vector3 float because the very first step only knows how to turn a position into a distance. Each link in the chain declares exactly what it consumes and what it produces next. Now, technically, we could call compile right after start. We get a fast reusable function that just takes in a vector3 and instantly returns a raw distance to the player as a float. But the real power in this technique is, of course, chaining things together. So step two, we turn that distance into a smooth zero to one score. Step three, let's convert the score into a final yes or no answer based on the threshold. And then let's call compile so that we package the whole sequence into one fast, reusable method that can be called anywhere. Let's convert our var into its explicit type. You can see that it's the same processor delegate that we defined in the other file. It takes in a vector three and returns a boolean. Additionally, because each then call returns a new chain with a specific output type, the compiler can use that return type to infer the exact input type the next processor must accept. So we can actually remove these redundant argument types. Now this looks clean and works perfectly for a simple generic chain, but we can make it much more powerful. What if each step of the chain could unlock methods that only make sense at that exact stage? or could highlight the target immediately after filtering with full IntelliSense and no way to call them in the wrong order. To get that truly fluent domain-aware builder where every stage knows exactly who it is and what comes next, we're going to introduce a new base class. This fluent chain abstract class is very similar to the chain class we made a few minutes ago, except this time we're including a self-referencing generic parameter, t-derived. T derived represents a class that inherits from this base class, and we're going to use it to tell the base class to return the derived type, not the base type, so that the fluent chain stays perfectly type safe and type aware at every step. To help us with this, we're going to have a delegate that will be the behind the scenes factory that lets each stage of the chain create the next one without any restrictions on how the concrete chain classes are built. Its only job is to take a finished processor and hand back the correct next chain object. So even though this looks complicated, the factory delegate simply says, give me a processor that turns T in into T out, and I'll give you back the correct next chain object of type T chain. When we use this factory delegate in our fluent chain class, we'll always know what type T chain should be because we're keeping track of T derived. I know for some of you seeing out T in and in T out will look strange, but remember this is about generic variants and completely unrelated to the in out keywords you would use with method parameters. Here, in means contravariant and out means covariant. This will allow the base class to call a factory that was created by any derived class, now and in the future, without the compiler complaining. Well, let's get into the implementation details and see how it comes together. We'll keep the current processor here, just like before, but now each derived chain type can interpret and extend this however it likes. The constructor will ensure that every chain stage starts with a valid processor. No processor, let's throw an exception. Now let's implement the heart of the system. We'll have a generic then method that connects processors together while returning the correct derived chain type for the next stage. The base class doesn't know what the next concrete stage is, whether it's a scored chain or a filtered chain or something custom, so it can't call new by itself. Instead, the current stage hands it two things, the next processor, which is the actual logic, of course, and the factory delegate that says exactly how to build the next chain object. We can add two constraints here. We could constrain it so that the next chain object must be a fluent stage that takes T in, produces T next, and knows its own concrete type. We can also say that the processor you give me must accept whatever this stage currently outputs, which is T out, and return the new type, which is T next. Let's add two guard clauses just to make sure we never pass in null here. And then we're going to combine the current processor with the new one using the combined class that we wrote earlier. Then we'll call our factory to wrap it in the correct next fluent type. 
and returns the real concrete stage so that the chain never degrades to the base class. The factory guarantees that you always get the correct derived type with all of its special methods intact. Now, just like in our simpler chain class, we're going to have a run method. Here, let's just make sure that we have a processor, and then we can test the chain immediately, feed it an input, and get a result right away. Likewise, if we want to compile this to a delegate, we can have the same guard clause, but then we'll turn the entire chain, no matter how many steps, into a single reusable delegate. You might notice that T derived never appears directly in the base class code. If we were to remove that T derived constraint on the base class, C sharp would refuse to let any derived class claim that it could return a more specific type than the base. The compiler would force every then method call to return just fluent chain, and you'd lose your exact derived type after the first step. I know that's a lot to take in, especially if you're a beginner, but why don't we build a concrete type and hopefully it'll make a little bit more sense. Our concrete types can actually be quite concise. Let's have a distance chain that inherits from the base class. Input is vector three, output is float, and the concrete type of this stage is distance chain. We just need a simple constructor, just forward the processor to the base, then we'll have a static method that is our factory. It matches the chain factory delegate we built earlier, its only job is to take a processor and return the correct next stage. So here we're saying that the next stage in the chain is going to be a scored chain. And now here's the payoff. When we write then new distance scorer, this method will run. It says take this scorer, combine it with what we already have, and use the create scored chain to wrap it in the proper derived class. The base class does all the work. We just declare what comes next and how to build it. Here in this video, we'll always move to a scored chain after distance chain, but of course you could elaborate on this to give yourself more options. So let's move on to the scoring stage. Here the input is still vector three and output is still float, but this is the scored chain and the only place where scoring specific methods are allowed. The factory for the next step knows exactly how to build a filtered chain when we're finished. And now here's one of the powerful features of this kind of approach. We can add specific methods to this part of the chain. Here we could insert a clamp that zeroes out scores beyond a certain distance. And because we return a new score chain, this method is chainable and immutable friendly. Finally, when we decide to add a filter, like threshold filter, we'll move forward into the filtered chain type. Exactly the same as what we did previously, we're just moving to another type in the chain. Now, for the clamp itself, we just need a tiny reusable class that implements iProcessor and does exactly what it says. It's going to turn faraway things into a clean zero score. We can store a max distance score threshold, and in the process method, if the score is less than that threshold, we return zero. Otherwise, we return the score. Now, let's create one more stage for our chain. We'll call this one the filtered chain. This is the terminal stage of our pipeline. The overall chain now consumes a vector three and produces a final Boolean. Inside of here, we'll have a static factory that simply returns a new filtered chain. Now, in this stage of the chain, we might also want to have some specific methods. Maybe we could have a method that does some logging. So it performs the side effect, which is logging, and then returns the same filtered chain instance to preserve the fluent chaining. Now we'll also implement a then method that returns a filtered chain. This way you could continue to have more terminal actions and they could actually be in any order. Now to make this whole system really easy to use, let's create a chain static class so that we have clean expressive entry points. We might have a method we call from player. This is a one liner to start measuring distance from the player. You could do the same thing in a slightly different way. Let's call this method start. Here, instead of taking in the player, we take in the processor that's already made. Now, you could do this as well as a full generic version, but here you can pass in just about anything. So let's just comment that out. It'll keep everything discoverable and prevent accidental misuse. Just for interest's sake, why don't we make one more terminal side effect processor? We might want to highlight an object if we're close enough to it or kick off some other event in the game. If we take in a target, then during the process method, we could actually get a hold of its renderer. And maybe if we're close enough, meaning the end value of our chain is true, we could turn it red. Otherwise, we set it to white. Then we just return the Boolean value to keep the chain going. Now, of course, this activity is just for demo and wouldn't be very efficient in a hot path. You'd probably want to make sure the renderer isn't null the first time and then just cache the property block. Okay, we've written a lot of code, some of it fairly complex. Let's see what the payoff is. So first of all, let's store these delegates at the class level so that we could use them in update if we wanted, for example. Let's have one called should attack. 
and let's have another one called highlight close. Let's also keep a reference to the player. I'm just going to call this one target. Now to start a new chain, all we have to do is call chain.start and we pass in the first processor. This isn't much different than what we were doing earlier, except now if I try to chain a method, look what we get for options. Immediately I can see that a then method will lead me into a scored chain type, or I can compile or I can just run. Let's move into the next stage of the chain, the scored type. Now, because we're maintaining the derived type all the way through the fluent chain, we have access to new things here. For example, our with max distance method that only exists on a scored chain. We can also move to the terminal chain point, the filtered chain, or we can just choose to stop and run and compile here. So let's set a max distance for our scorer, then we'll move into our final chain segment. Here again, this doesn't look too much different than our simple chain. However, we now have access to methods that are specific to this point in the chain, such as log2. So we might choose to log to one channel, and in fact because that method returns the same type, we can just chain it right into another method. So what have we achieved here that's an improvement over the simple chain? Well, we have type safety. We have domain-specific methods like log2 and with max distance. We have better IntelliSense. Each chain type exposes only valid operations for that stage. This means that people can't compose their chains in an incorrect sequence. It's easy to see how order would matter here. Now you can probably think of other examples, maybe a skill bonus chain. You could start with multiplication, add flat bonuses, and then apply percentage effects at the end. This way you're guaranteed that all of your math executes in the correct order. And you still get the delegate that you can pass around like a piece of data into your state machines or to any system. Why don't we make one more chain just to give us a little example inside of Unity. We'll basically do the same thing, but here at the terminal point, Let's add one more filtered chain that just has a side effect to changing the object's color to red if we're close enough. Then we could just check that every update. Now instead of scrolling down, why don't we just put an expression body update method here. We'll just invoke that delegate every frame. So I've set up a little cube in the top left corner there and I've added the example mono behavior to it. I'm just going to adjust the distance threshold here. Let's do a point 0.1. And of course, we need to drag a reference to the player into there so that when the player gets close enough, something will happen. Here in play mode, as soon as I get within the threshold, there we go, turns red. Move away, turns white. So our little compiled function is doing exactly as expected. Now, if I were to change the threshold on the fly here, let's make it a little more forgiving. You can see the material already changed there in the inspector. And of course, now we have to move quite a bit farther away before it turns white again. Now you can see the other output from the logs and from the other delegate there in the console. And so I guess that's about it. I know a lot of people are thinking, well, that's way too complex. I'm never going to implement that in my game. And of course, you don't have to. You can get a lot of benefit out of the simple version we made at the start of the video. But if you have a need for domain specific methods at any stage and you need your chain to execute in a specific order, now you know how that can be done. And of course, this pattern exists out there in the real world. The further along you go in your game dev journey, the more likely it is that you're going to run into these more advanced concepts. And with that being said, I'm going to wrap it up. I'm going to leave this code up in a gist probably if you want to go and have a look and think about it more later. Come join us on Discord if you feel like it. There's always lots of people discussing their projects just like you. And of course, hit that bell so you don't miss next week's video. Maybe next week we'll step away from code a little bit and spend more time inside of Unity. Until then, I'll throw another video up on the screen. Maybe I'll see you there.